Step one is to make sure we have the uh, philosophic underpinnings of what factor analysis is about. Whenever we're dealing with a representation of the data, it's a model. So you can see here is the real thing. This is a picture of a real Boeing 747, and here's the model. It looks kind of like the real thing, but we simplified it. We made it simpler. We threw away details to get the big picture. And so that's what we're doing. Every factor analysis is an attempt to model the data, to say this is what the data looks like. And to get there, we have to throw away some details. And the question is, have we thrown away it validly and correctly? Can we justify that? So we're trying to look at, this is what the real world looks like. Everything is connected to everything. That's the real world of, of um, all data. Everything is connected to everything. But maybe not everything is important. And so we're trying to find the important features that characterize the data. So factor analysis is an attempt to make the world simpler, but represent it correctly. And that's the tension. If you try to keep all the data, you have to explain every item's relationship to every item. And that is impossible to do and impossible to understand and will get you a fail at the doctoral level. We're not interested in a report that says item 1 is connected this way to items 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 11, 11, 11, boring. We want to make sense of the world. So, the thing about a model is that it's theoretically driven. This model is an attempt to mimic the reality of, this is the major features of an airplane. I'm not going to show you everything, here's the big ideas. And so we do that using an interaction of data and theory. Fundamentally, data do not explain themselves. Without a theory to guide your analysis, this is what I think it looks like. Let's see if I'm right. They, uh, you cannot really make progress. And although you can throw the data in the air and see where it lands, that's not what science is about. Science is about having a theory of how do I explain this data. And the question is, what is the best model Obviously, a best model is the model that says everything is connected with everything. But nobody can understand that model. You know, you've got lines going from everything to everything. So, you know, you have to make decisions. So, factor analysis is a technique that helps us simplify the data by forcing our theoretical reasons to pay attention to these are the key things we want to do. And models come from theory. We have theories that explain how and why things are. Not just describe it, but explain it. So that means that you could then create an experiment where you try to control it. Uh, I think it was Kurt Lewin that said that if you think you understand the world, try to control it. And so our theories lead us to, this is how I'm going to control it. Theory and data have this weird relationship. Sometimes we discover theory from looking at the data. That's what the qualitative interpretivist researchers claim, that they can discover theory from looking at data. I'm, I guess I'm a little less impressed by that than others. Um, but. I think we often start with theories and then try to examine them. However, recently, oh, 10 years ago, five years ago, something like that, that was discovered that, announced that they had found methane on Mars. Immediately, with this phenomena, scientists tried to provide explanations. One group of scientists said, oh, this proves that there must have been water on Mars at some time. Another group of scientists said, oh no, it must mean there are small microbes living in Mars and they release methane. So, 
they're using their knowledge of how the reality works on Earth to say, what could cause this phenomenon? So you have this interaction between data and theory. But if you can't explain it, it's just noise. It's just who knows what it means. So modeling, from my point of view, is based in this hypothetical deductive or abductive approach. That means that I have an explanation and I want to test it, or I'm looking for an explanation in this data because something seems to be happening. What might it be? And what we're looking for is how we're going to connect the data. So if somebody who comes to you and says, I have done a survey, I want you to analyze it for me. I've had this experience. And he said, well, what's your theory? What do you believe these, how these things are organized? Is it just a matter that everything is correlated with everything? Or do you actually think that these items group together? And how does that group relate to this group? And they go, well, um, ah. He said, okay, draw me a picture of how you think your, your variables relate to each other. And sometimes it's shocking how people can't do that even though they have PhDs. But that's really the name of the game. It's one of the reasons I like the Angle software is because you have to draw a picture. If you can't draw a picture, you obviously don't understand what you're doing. So I always get people, just draw a sketch. How do you think this relates to that? Is it just... A causes B, B causes A, or is it just, you know, two things exist at the same time? What's your picture? Uh, and that looks like the same page. So here's one of my art from an article I've written, published in 2009, where we said, how students and teachers think about the world, any phenomenon in education, comes out of the interaction of their families, because families influence students, but families are part of a society, and societies also create policies. And these parents grew up in a certain policy environment, and so you get a system where these contexts influence individuals, and these is where teachers and students get their beliefs, and then they behave in a certain way, and you get a certain outcome. So if you think that what the human believes matters to what the human does and what that behavior achieves, then you have to start thinking about where did that come from? What are the influences? So that's a very high level way of understanding the causal influence. And of course, there's probably over time a loop that goes back here to here that what you got influences how things happen, like the Pisa shock of Germany in the early 2000s when they discovered, oh my god, we're not number one, we're terrible. And then Germany made a bunch of changes because they didn't like the outcome. And unfortunately, <clears throat> Andreas Schleicher at Pisa is always saying, well, the data says you should change your policy to get higher scores, and this is the policy you need to change. I'm not sure he's right all the time. It's a, sometimes a very simplistic about, you know, just change the, change your policy, usually in an economically liberal way, where we're going to pay teachers more if they get higher scores, you know, that kind of policy. So, another theoretical framework that I use is this framework from Isaac Eisen, he developed with Fishbein, that says, your beliefs, and the people around you, their beliefs, and your sense of control influence your goals, your intentions, your behaviors, and your outcomes. So the question for me is always, well, how do we know this belief is a good belief? And often for me, it's, well, what is the effect of this belief? And so you're looking at, if people believe X, and they do Y, do we like what we get? And if we don't like what we get, let's go back. And what we get is usually measured in terms of achievement, performance, those kinds of things. So how do we develop a model? Obviously, evidence from theory. 
I would use Isaac Eisen's theoretical framework as a way of guiding my design of my research. You might use different theories, and that's the problem with psychology, is we've got theories left, right, and center. And uh, some of them are well established, and others not so much. We can use evidence from previous studies. We look at, oh look, they did this and they found that. Hmm, is it true here? And of course, we can use evidence from the data where we can do different kinds of analyses to try and find out whether the data tells us what we need to do. So, are all models equally plausible? And that's the thing. So here's two models that your family social class influences your school success, which influences the first job you get. Or, the first job you get influences your school success, which influences your family social class. Are they equally plausible? From a statistical point of view, there's almost no difference in these models. A, B, C, one influences the other, switch it around. The statistics don't care. The numbers don't care where you got them from in the real world. So you have to have a way of thinking about the real world to judge the statistics. Okay? So you can believe that in terms of a child, the family influences the school, child's school success, which might probably influence their first job. At least in many English-speaking countries, uh, if mommy and daddy are reasonably well off, the children go to a better school, get better teachers, do better, and then they get a job, even if they were kind of dumb, with a company that their daddy has good connections. So even if the kid is kind of dumb, because of this resource, they get a good first job. Or they get a dumb job, but at a good company, right? You know that kind of thing? If you were doing this, you'd be like, well, let's look at people who are already in their jobs. Let's look at adults and say, what was your first job? How did that affect your child's school success? And then, did your child become upper or middle class? So you might say, well, let's look at families, kids who are adults who are in their first job, compare their social class to the social class of their children. So both models could be done with very different designs. And that's the challenge that we have. Our data comes out of a design. We had a theory when we created this data. The data don't just appear naturally by themselves. Somebody chooses the data, selects the data, designs the way of collecting the data, has a theory in mind. So both are plausible, but very different designs in order to test them. That if you start with a better job, your children end up in a higher social class. But then maybe you want to actually add these two things here and really make it a longitudinal study. And the problem is, especially if you're a PhD student, you don't have enough time to do a 20-year longitudinal study. You get three or four years, good luck, finish it. And so you might only do this part, or this part, or a small part, right? You can't do everything in a PhD. That's your life as an academic. So don't try to do everything in just one PhD. But you have to still be able to say, where does my tree fit in the forest? Okay. The problem with humans is that what's in our head is really hard to get at. It's very difficult to observe what people are thinking, feeling, deciding, how their emotions and motivations interact. It's very hard to get at what's in people's heads. Even if you put them in an fMRI machine and examine the movement of blood flow in their head, that still doesn't mean you know what they're thinking or feeling. It just shows you that when you trigger a stimulus, the blood moves to one or another part, and maybe this brain section is what's responsible for the human reaction. So, our mental, 
our mental properties are very difficult to measure. They're also very unstable. Our emotions and our feelings and our thoughts move all the time. And you can get distracted easily, and that's why driving a car and talking on the phone at the same time are very dangerous, because we find it hard to do one thing at a time. So we could measure some of these things with a proxy, a way of getting at this, with some measuring tools. And the measuring tools that we have are reasonably limited. I can ask you questions, like in an interview or a survey. I could ask you to tell me about yourself, you know, score yourself. I could stand there with a checklist of important behaviors and watch you while you're doing a project or doing some activity, and I could observe. Or, and this is the promise of big data, I could observe the traces you leave behind. Now, in older museums, you can actually see the wear and tear on floor surfaces. And you can use those traces of human behavior to realize that when people walk into a building, most people turn right first. So if you want to take advantage of that, you design things to take advantage of the way humans behave. And the internet is a wonderful way to track what are humans doing. And of course, you need a theory to make sense of that data because you can get overwhelmed with the data. And all of these create challenges for the design of studies and the statistics we have to use because we're trying to be certain about something that is not stable or certain. We can't be sure that when someone says, I feel sad, that their statement, I feel sad, equals someone else's statement, I feel sad. How sad is sad? I mean, for some people, they'll have a very high norm, and others a very low norm. Right? So it, this stuff is hard to get at. So there's a lot of uncertainties and a lot of difficulties. And some people say, therefore, you shouldn't bother because it's so uncertain. But I persist. The assumption that we have to make in measurement and, is, and, and what we're trying to do is that there's always error. So when someone says, I feel sad, and we say, well, how sad do you feel on a, from minus infinity to super infinity, where, where do you stand? Every time they give you an answer, it's an estimate. There's an error component. Even physical measures have error. The meter is the length of a certain platinum bar in Paris. They created a platinum bar that after they had done a whole bunch of measurements from, along the, um, from Barcelona to Dunkirk they, in the 1800s. It's a really interesting book you can read about how they actually estimated the length of a meter. And they created a platinum bar and it's kept in a vacuum in Paris and that's the official length of the meter. The meter is supposed to be 10 million of these is from the equator to the North Pole. That's the definition of a meter. It's supposed to be 1 10 millionth of the distance from the equator to the North Pole. But now that we have satellite surveys, we can realize that the meter is actually wrong by 0 0.2 millimeters. But that doesn't mean we're going to go and change the measurement system for the meter. We're just going to live with the meter is not a meter, but it is a meter because we're going to say it's a meter, right? <laughs> Which is kind of, that's sometimes the way things are. In this physical property, there is error. If you measure a metal table, its length in the morning, and then put it in the sun all day long, and you measure it again, it will have changed size. Not your meter is wrong, but the table changed. If tables can change, if metal can expand and contract with environments, how much more so humans, right? So this is part of the whole design. There are fewer amounts of error in physical phenomena, and certainly much more in social and psychological processes. 
ask a teenager, do you love your mother? And you'll probably get a very negative answer. Ask a four-year-old, do you love your mother? And you'll get a super excited answer, positive, but it's the same child and the same mother, right? The point of this whole trying to get the measurement is to make sure that we can make legitimate decisions. We're trying to measure reality so we can inform decision making. So that's why we're here in this game. And we want enough accuracy, not absolute accuracy, but sufficient accuracy to eliminate alternative explanations. We want to be able to say, well, because of the way we measured this, we think this answer is wrong, and this answer is probably right. But it will still be with uncertainty. Responses, the data that we're going to use, come from humans. Humans answer questionnaires, humans do tests, humans get observed, humans get interviewed and surveyed, and that data is what we're trying to estimate and what we're looking for is how do things group together? Because I can't make sense of 53 answers. My brain is not big enough to handle 53. Um, our principle when we were designing the computer test system in New Zealand was the answer must be eight, no more than eight. Humans find it difficult to juggle more than eight things at the same time in their heads. Um, the psych research people say seven plus or minus two. So that's between five and nine in terms of the, how we handle memory. So we need to make the world simpler so we can think about it. what does it mean? And what we're looking for is responses that group together, that behave in a very similar way. And those will call some sort of latent, there's some invisible thing that makes these things behave in the same way. And that's what a factor analysis is about. It's trying to find the invisible, unmeasured thing that explains how, why these answers behave in a similar way. And from that, we get the, co the correlation and covariance of how all of these items behave. So what we're looking at is a matrix, variable 1 to 10, variable 1 to 10, how do they relate, and hopefully the ones that are share something, some idea in common, will show that in the pattern of the values of when we look at the uh, correlation covariance matrix. So we'll see some evidence that these things behave in a similar way. We're looking for multiple indicators, so this is one of the traits that we use. This is what often distinguishes psychology research from sociology research. Sociological research is very much, they're very efficient. They want to know, how rich are you, so I can put you on a scale and give you a score between one and whatever, and so that I can use one indicator to say, this is your wealth. This indicator is your sex. This indicator is um, where you live. And so I can use very simple indicators. Psychology is much more interested in complex things, like how much do you love your mother? Now I could ask you, but one question to estimate the sense of how much you love your mother might not be a very good measure. It might not get very close. So we like to use multiple indicators to get a sense of, this is the true value of how much you love your mother. And so we tend to look for three or more indicators for each idea. Measures of a domain, like test items and survey items, are an attempt to get a sample of behaviors. Now, we cannot walk around we're not probably going to do participant observations and be anthropological and go live with these people 24-7 to find out really what they think about their mothers. So we <coughs> want to create some samples to find out there is no oil or yes, there is oil. So we drill in multiple places to say, I think this is what this domain looks like. I'm going to collect data for 
the characteristics of that domain and see how high or low each person is on that. Because what we're interested in is complicated and it's difficult to get data, so we try to collect data efficiently, but we want multiple samples of that domain, the construct. Basically, when we're designing research in this kind of area, it's, we use research methods that say, well, actually, it's not one thing. There's multiple aspects of how much you love your mother. Like, there are behaviors. Do you send her cards? Do you phone her? Do you visit her? Right? These are indicators of how much you love your mother. And how often you do these things might be an indicator. But if your mother has died, then how much do you love your mother? You can't go visit her, but you could visit the grave, and you could think about her, and you could even talk to her. You know, So all of these indicators are ways of estimating a domain. And most domains are multifaceted and complex. And so we have to select the big ideas, the rich ideas, rather than the details. To find out what we're measuring, this is why experts are so important, people who study the field. And we have to think about what could interfere with the data collection. The time of day interferes with data collection. They tell you never to buy a car that's made on a Monday morning or a Friday afternoon because workers are not in good mental spaces when they're working. It's also why one, the, the car companies are using machines and robots because the robots don't have hangovers. When we measure something, this is the fundamental premise that we work with. That the true value, which we're trying to estimate, consists of the observed value, the number we got, the score we got, plus the error. And we don't know how much error there is. So we have two unknowns, the true value and the error. We don't know what those are. All we really know is the observed value but we know that the observed value is not the whole truth. It's, there's a noise in there. You know, like in the old days when listening to shortwave radio and you turn the dial and you start to get the sound, yeah, that's it, Radio Free Europe, yes, I can hear you now. There's all that, and we try to clean it up so that we get just the signal. That's what we're interested in, is the true value, the signal. But there's always noise around the observed value. And this is our fundamental problem with any measurement challenge. And the error is for multiple reasons. And in factor analysis, you think a lot about error because it's related to, this is the classical test theory composition of any score. The score is equal to what you really can do plus the noise. Like if you don't think this test is very important, you don't try very hard, so your observed value is low, because not because your true ability is low, but because you didn't try and you created more error around that. And part of the problem is sometimes our definition of the thing we're really interested in is not very good. We, not, we don't even agree with each other on what this love your mother really means. Right? So, latent trait is where we say your observed values are caused by this true, vet, true score of the construct that we're really interested in but we cannot measure directly. Okay? So that's the key notion of latent, is it cannot be measured directly. We're guessing that it's there based on the evidence we have. The most classic uh, description of uh, latent traits in education, education psychology, is intelligence. Based on your answers to these test questions, and the fact that you answered so many correctly in such a short period of time, we presume you must have more intelligence. Because intelligence allows you 
according to the definition, be able to do the things in your environment that allow you to succeed in the environment. So we have a definition of what the thing is, and we use evidence to, from the observed evidence to make inferences about the latent thing. Of course, your ability to get questions right on an intelligence test can be influenced by did you stay up late the night before, did you have breakfast, did you have an argument with your spouse or your parents, and so on and so forth. So there's always noise in that environment because humans are not machines. Goodness. So our model is to try and estimate this trait, this factor, and that's what factor analysis is about. It's trying to estimate the existence of a latent construct. And because we're not sociologists, we, we use the idea that you need multiple indicators to prove or support the claim that there is a latent trait. So multiple indicators say, we'll get a stable estimate. So we'll use different kinds of questions or different types of behavior reports about how you relate to your mother to get a sense of how strong is your affection for your mother or how negative is it or how weak is it. But we'll use these, we'll design a bunch of indicators that if you have high scores on each of these indicators, we would infer you must really love your mother. But did we measure? your love for your mother? No. We estimated your love for your mother based on how you responded to the manifest indicators. And we want lots of items because for each item there's error. And we're trying to ignore the error to get a proper estimate. And things go wrong like I wanted, I thought I was answering A, you know like those multiple choice answer grids, and you're answering number three, but you put your answer on number four, and everything goes out of line, and you look like you're really dumb, but it's just because you made a systematic error, but you got a low score because of an error. Uh, sometimes on a rating scale, we have strongly agree, moderately agree, kind of not really agree, disagree. You know, we get these options, and then you're like, I have to use option three or option four, but really I'm a little more than three, but not as much as four. You know, I want somewhere in the middle, and some kids will fill in the middle point, and they'll annoy you, and you go, well, what do you, you know, they're trying to indicate the sense of their truth, but your mechanism doesn't allow them to do that. Yeah, bloody kids, right? So our value of how much do you love your mother is an estimate. Does anyone know how much they love their mother? Really? No, like compared to what? So, we're arguing that multiple indicators are needed to give us a stronger, accurate sense of the truth of that latent variable that we're interested in. And in introducing yourselves, you all identified certain key constructs that you want to work with. And so you have, that's, well, that's a, how does that manifest itself? How does that play out in the real world? What does it look like? How will you know it's there? And that's what these indicators are attempts to do. So all parameter values in our model are estimates. Uh, they're more or less right, but they have error. And that's really important for us when we get to statistical significance, is how big is the error? And the short answer is the more people you have, the smaller the error estimate. And uh, da, 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 da. if the latent construct is real, it should still behave in the same way if you shift from one group of people to another group of people. It should be stable. This is an interesting question about the notion of intelligence, like the classic example that I learned about was from uh, Luria here in Russia in the 1930s where you go, okay, bears that live in the north are white. Boris lives in the north. 
he, Boris saw a bear. What color was the bear that Boris saw? Now, you and I have been to school, you know the answer is Boris saw a white bear. But Luria reported that, well, some of these people went, well, wait a minute, I don't know Boris. I don't know if Boris tells me the truth or Boris lies. Uh, I've never been to the north and I don't know Boris, so I don't know what color bear he saw. You know? So is that a dumb answer? No, it's an intelligent answer. It's just not the schooled answer. If you go to school, you know how to fill in these syllogisms, right? You know, because you get taught how to do it in school. If you don't go to school, it doesn't mean you're not dumb. It doesn't mean you're dumb. It means you could be intelligent in a different way. So, you know, we need to be careful about if we suddenly take our test. There's another example the Scrivener and Cole, they went to Liberia and they found a group of people in Liberia that had writing but no schools. So they learned writing just socially without school system. And they did a Piagetian conservation task with these people, the Capelli people. And they gave them 20 objects that were in pairs. Sorry, 20 objects that should go into four groups, five instruments, five food groups, and so on, clothing. And they said, put these together as you think they should go together. And they were very surprised that they didn't put them in four groups. They put the hoe with the potato because you use a hoe to dig up a potato. The knife goes with the orange because you use a knife to peel the orange. So they were putting things together functionally. And they said, why do you do that? Because that's what a wise person would do. <laughs> he said, so what would a foolish person do? And the foolish person would put them into the four groups according to the Piagetian conservation, uh, Piagetian organization categories that we would use. So for their point of view, we were dumb and they were smart. But according to the test, they were dumb and we were smart. But they could do what we wanted. They just didn't think it was a smart thing to do. So intelligence would change depending on these contexts. So that's part of the problem when you start to go design a latent construct and indicators for that latent construct. It's a function of your environment that you're in. And if you transport it somewhere else, it just might not work because the environment's different. So, latent trait theory says that items in a measure are samples of a domain being evaluated. They will be correlated and covariant, but the errors are independent. What causes you to answer question one in the way it does, the things that distract you when you answer question one, should be independent of the things that distract you when you answer number two and number three. So that the errors are free from each other. They don't correlate with each other. And this is really important when it comes to factor analysis because you will find people who say, well, we made the model fit better if we correlated the error for number one with number five. But that goes against the fundamental premises of classical test theory and factor analysis that errors are independent of each other. An error of item one has a zero correlation with the error of number two. That's the assumption that we have to deal with. If it's not random, then the measurement is biased. I don't know if you've ever heard the concept of a bloated specific. Yes. And my, <clears throat> our colleague, her bloated specific, it means it's inflated. It's made larger than it is by artificial means. It's bloated. Like you eat too much fatty food and you feel full of gas, bloated. So, a bloated specific is when you measure one thing the same way multiple times and everything is highly correlated because you basically ask the same question multiple times. I love my big toe. My big toe is wonderful. My big toe is great. My big toe is the best toe. Of course they're going to be correlated because it's actually only one thing. You didn't ask multiple things. It only looks like multiple things. And so it inflates the estimate because they're correlated with each other. And uh, there are certain researchers in the world who 
when you look at their scales, you go, well, actually, this set of items is really just the same thing over and over and over again. With almost identical wording, too. So no wonder it is so reliable. Because it's actually a bloated specific. And it's that, yes. When, well, when the indicators are the same. Is it bad? Well, if you want to get famous and get published, high reliability is considered a good thing. It gives you high reliability. But is it a valid measure or just a reliable measure? So it's reliable, but is it meaningful? So it depends on your goal. I would discourage you from doing it, but there are famous people who have scales that are highly repeated and people use them all the time, but actually they suffer from the same item asked multiple times in almost identical wording. So I, I would say it's a bad thing. But if you ask someone else, they'd say, no, 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 that's the way you should do it. To this, uh, instrument. <laughs> yeah, there are instruments that are published out there and get... I mean, public paper about this instrument. Yeah, 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 and then they get used again and again. Herb Marsh's self-concept scales are full of this. But uh, y your point is that um, exactly the same indicators uh, don't uh, allow us to measure level trade in a valid way. Yeah. All the indicators should be a little bit different. They should be distinguishable aspects of the domain. They should be identifiable. They're measuring the same thing. But they shouldn't be a function of, I just repeated the words and maybe changed the word order. My big toe is the best. My big toe is the best. You know, like when you play poetry with the words, you can get inflated reliabilities because you're tricking yourself. So, a latent trait theory about scores is the observed score is equal to the true score plus random error which we can't control. Somebody comes to school and they saw a car accident. It's going to influence them when they sit down to do the test. That's random. Plus systematic error, like we wrote bad questions, or we gave the wrong option the correct answer. Those are our responsibility. In a perfect world, this would be zero. This would be small. And the true score would be a good estimate the observed score would be a good estimate of the true score. And that's perhaps what we can do in high stakes testing. Everybody studies, everybody works really hard, everybody had a good teacher, everybody had a good night's sleep, everybody has good breakfast. No one was yelling at home, there's no noise outside while the students are doing the test, you know. In a perfect world, we control the systematic, the random is kind of small, and what we're looking for is the kids who get a high score actually can do more than the kids who got a low score. That's our fundamental premise. So random is inevitable, but we need to remove the systematic. So when you get inflation reliabilities, you should, or very high reliabilities, you should really look at the instrument say, hmm, one scale I used in my doctorate, I, my supervisor and I looked at it and went, ah, okay, this is a good one, it's got a high loading, we like this one, but number two is almost the same as number one, so we're going to ignore that one and pick something, try to pick different aspects of the construct. That's the goal. So, this is the hard part, it begins with the numbers and formulas and math. So what we're trying to do is say, and this is where, thank God, we have computers who can do most of the calculations, that it's a bit of a black box and I trust the statisticians. So what we're trying to do is say, do the numbers support our theory? Or do the numbers not support our theory and we got it wrong? Because the numbers from the data are the reality we have to work with. I have a question. Sure. Uh, about global specifics. Yeah. If we have, you know, such artifacts like when negative items 
extent to correlate with each other. Yeah. Or when items with similar wordings tend to correlate together, is it also kind of blood specific or some artificial? That's a judgment call. It, it's a, it's a, the art of being a researcher is to look at the data you got and say, yes, negatively worded items will correlate because they share this contradiction, negative thing. And the positive ones will be on the other hand and they'll group together. And then if you go, but that's not what I designed, then you know the response, the result is a function of how you wrote the items rather than the content of the items. And then people are responding to all the negative ones in a different way to all the positive ones. It's one of the reasons I don't use negatively worded items in any of the research I do, because I think how you answer a negatively worded question is a very strange thing in your head. I have to stop and think when I'm asked surveys where they go, do you agree or disagree? Uh, I am not a lazy person. I am not a lazy person. Yes, I am a lazy person. Yeah, I can answer that. No, 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 I'm not a lazy person. So when it says, I am not a lazy person, do I say, yes, I'm not a lazy person, or do I say, no, I'm not a lazy person? And if you're Chinese, you say, yes, I'm not a lazy person. And if you're a Westerner, you go, no, I'm not a lazy person. So which is the correct answer? This is, you know, like, so these kinds of statements are a big disaster to avoid. And you will get, if you have a set of negative worded items to prevent a response style, because there are people who do that, they put negative worded items in there to prevent a response style, what you find is all the negative worded items grouped together into a factor called negative worded items. Mm -hmm. And you're not measuring the construct, mm -hmm. laziness, <laughs> You're measuring the wording, the syntax, the grammar that you used, and people are getting confused by the grammar <coughs> instead of thinking about the content. Yes? But yeah. if uh, there is no any confusing wording, I mean that you can uh, develop, for example, 10 items about that, that you are a good person, mm -hmm. and for example, five items such as I am a bad person, and yeah. I disagree or agree. And if this is the case where where it's not any artificial, words, yeah. but then uh, it's highly likely that we will get also two factors. And uh, at theoretically and ideally, yes. But humans behave in weird ways, and sometimes the data so, doesn't work. Uh, am I right that uh, your point is that we have to avoid as confusing wording? And uh, the just the opposite, even if it's not confusing. No, I, I don't think you should do that. I think what you should think about is, are you putting in the opposites just to make sure they don't get in a habit? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Or are you actually saying there's another side of this coin? On the one side, you can be good this way, but a healthy person might look like they're bad for these reasons. So it depends on what's your theory for putting in the opposite wording. I, I mean that there is a uh, opinion that there is a tendency to... Um, there is regression to the middle yeah. or regression to the one of the points. Yeah. And as I know, we use... Uh, some sort of negative statements uh, mm -hmm. to avoid these uh, yeah. regressions. That's too. And what's your point of view? How we handle yeah. it? Um, the the what you're trying to address there is the problem of response style. Yeah. Some people just like to go in the middle, always answer the middle. Some people like to be very positive. Yes, yes, yes. I'm yay. Yeah. Yeah. And other people are grumpy, and they always answer no. So what you're trying to detect then is response style rather than measure the construct. You're trying to eliminate response style. Yeah, and how to do this?
So, how I've done it yep. in my inventories is I have, this is the positive purpose, and here's a negative purpose. So the negative ones, should, if I ask them, so I ask them about the negative stuff as well as the positive stuff. My mother is amazing. I love my mother. She's, she always cares for me. Uh, my mother gets angry with me. My mom, mother yeah. doesn't approve of, my mother disapproves of my behavior. Yeah. And so you have a positive and a negative thing, but it's stated in exactly the same way. And they say, oh yeah, my mother disapproves of me. Yeah, yeah but I, my mother loves me. You know? And then you're going to look at uh, how do those constructs correlate with each other. Yeah, but the problem is that it's highly likely that negative and positive statements will be the different, uh, will have different flow elements. Yes, but... And how to handle it? It's, it's the same construct as we suppose it to be, but from the statistical point of view, it's highly likely that we'll get... Uh, well, what I would do is force it to be two constructs and look at the correlation between the two constructs. Okay. If it's negative, that my mother disapproves of me compared to my mother loves me, if that correlation is negative, then it looks like it's behaving the way it should, logically. Okay. Especially if you designed it to say, well, you know, mothers and children don't always get along, so that's part of the construct, so I've got some indicators for that aspect of my relationship with my mother. And so I would create a multi-dimensional inventory rather than reverse score these and yeah, yeah. make them part of, if it's true that there isn't a response style, then the correlation should be inverse. That's how I deal with it, rather than reverse score them. The that other thing I do, which not many people do, is I, I assume in education almost everybody agrees with everything. Because in education, you have to agree, even if you disagree. <laughs> I want to keep getting paid, I want to keep my job, so I shut up and say yes, even though I don't really believe it. So I give people four choices of saying yes and only two choices of saying no. Slightly agree, moderately agree, mostly agree, strongly agree. So I know that mostly and strongly means yes, you really agree. Slightly and moderately agree means, yeah, I kind of agree. I'm, maybe I'm afraid to say no, but, you know, yes, I'm positive. And then on the negative side, I give them mostly disagree and strongly disagree. So I get a six-point scale that ranges from strongly disagree to strongly agree, but it's positively packed because I expect people to say yes. They're biased to say yes. So I give them more freedom in the yes space. And the research I've done says this behave, this works really well with educational phenomena. Sorry, last question. Uh, am I right that the reverse in scoring is a uh, bad idea? Yep. Well, it depends. Yeah, I prefer not to do it. Well, if you've got if you've got a balanced scale, theoretically you should be able to reverse it. But shouldn't it that be an empirical question? If you give people the statement. Uh, my mother is wonderful, and my mother is not wonderful, do they actually evaluate them as being mirror opposites of each other? But, but if they are. Okay, assuming they are, then you should be able to get away with it. But it's an empirical question. Okay. I hope you're right, but I try to avoid this problem. The other option is if you must have a lying scale, don't include it in the model. Exclude those negative items. Just take them out and go, look, you answered them logically, but I'm not going to include them in my measurement. I just used it to find people who were being dumb or lazy, right? <coughs> so I would use them as a check to remove invalid responders but I would not include it in the analysis.
I'd only use them to screen for legitimate people. Oh, okay. Uh, Wonderful. Did you, did you have uh, uh, a published research with that not symmetrical scale oh, yeah. of answers? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, yes, you can find it on my Google Scholar page, 2004 Psychological Reports. Right. Where are we here? Okay. So, this is why I'm not a sociologist, because sociologists trust single indicators. Now, if I ask you your age, most people will tell you the truth, and their answer, I'm 63, is not perfect, because it's 63 and so many days or months. You might be almost 64, or you might have just turned 63 today, right? So the answer is still imperfect, but it's a pretty good measure. When you ask people, what sex are you? Most people will say man, woman, and they don't lie about it. That's what they are. How much do you love your mother, on the other hand? You are biased to lie because it's socially disapproved to say, I hate my mother. You must be a crazy person and need to get psychiatric treatment, right? Even if there's a good reason to hate your mother, you still don't say those things out loud. It might be in your head. So, how do we get at those things? Because they're hard to get at, they're hard to estimate, because they have multiple faces, we use these multiple measures. Sorry, how are we doing for time? I have 22 minutes. Oh, till 11.30, excellent. I don't even know how far I've got, and it doesn't matter, the notes are gonna be downloadable. So, the manifest variables are the observed data that we actually use, the latent thing is what we're trying to get at, and in test theory, we use these three constructs. Your ability is this range, so this might be your attitude to your mother, depending on the time of day, and uh, this is your real attitude. But on the test, you have, on the survey, you have this score. It's in the ability, but on the test, there's a measurement error. So for every observation, there's a measurement error. And hopefully, your test score lies in your real ability. Or your survey score represents your real ability. And this is the thing that's the invisible thing, the latent thing. We see the observed score. We can estimate the error in the observed score. But we really are trying, we're really interested in your latent ability, not just your observed score. So latent trait theory says that everything is caused by at least two things. Every observed behavior, which answer you chose, how strongly you say yes or no to a question, that's your observed behavior, is explained by the latent trait that has your underlying attitude, ability, score, the, how much you love your mother's score, and the error, the residual, the unexplained thing, everything else in the universe that influenced you when you came to answering that question. Right? So those are the two unobserved explanations for that influence how you answer the question. A good model explicitly includes both the everything in the universe that I didn't include in my measurements and the thing I'm really interested in as explanations for how you answer the items on the survey or on the test. So, multiple factors are, are involved. And how we can account for all of these factors simultaneously is the, both the art and the magic and the science of what we do as data analysis. So, in test questions, where the question's hard or easy, is the person good or not so good at this? Do the questions discriminate? Do they separate? Or do everybody get it right and everybody get it wrong? Or everybody agrees or, you know, some people don't. Whether they're shared, the content, how smart they are, all of these things influence, create noise around the signal that we're interested in. And that's just a challenge. And physicians and medical people 
have noise in their measurements too. So, we care about the directly measured behaviors and variables. This is where you operationalize your theory. What will be the indicators that say, if someone answers yes or correctly, this means they have the latent thing we're interested in. And this is the thing that we're really interested in. We want to use this to explain the world of these things. So the goal is to use the latent things to explain the observed things. So your attitude towards something explains how you behave in that space. It's assumed that if students are motivated, they'll do well. If they like this subject I'm teaching, they'll do well. So teachers tend to spend a lot of time helping kids get excited, motivated, interested, and supposedly they're supposed to do better. Unfortunately, the data doesn't always say that's true. You know, one thing that guarantees they'll do better is to teach them how to do it, not how to like it. So, why sociology is usually different? Because they use single items and they tend to use uh, they'll create an index from manifest variables. <coughs> so they'll say, your socioeconomic status is a function of your education, your income, where you live. Those things create that. In psychology, we say, well, actually, your love of your mother explains how you answered these items. So we're putting the latent variable as the cause, not the effect. We use multiple indicators, not a single indicator, and we use structural equation modeling. We can use path analysis, and we will try to get to that in this course, and we'll try to get to some structural equation modeling on top of the factor analysis. If, ever, if we all go as quickly as I've written the plan, um, if we don't, well, it's better that you learn deeply and correctly than quickly. Um, so, latent theories explain things are generally linear. That is, we think things happen in a line. Now, the line might be curved, or it could be straight, but generally, to make sense of the real world, we do simple things like this. If you have more intelligence, you'll do better at school. If you do better at school, you'll have, get a better job and earn more money, which means you will be successful in life, which means your children will be smarter. Right? It, it's the simplest way of thinking about causation. A causes B, B causes C, and it's okay because we're brains of very small, we're bears with small brains, right? We can't understand everything. And so we try to make the world simpler. Because if we can find out that this is true, then maybe we can do something about this. That if school success matters, because it makes children smarter later on, then how can we make more kids successful in school? Then that gives us something we can do. That's a lever we can pull that might change society in 20 or 30 or 50 years. If we know the answer to this equation, if we know that, that this is true. On the other hand, we know that if you have high socioeconomic resources, you tend to do better at school, and you do better at work, and basically society replicates itself. And those of us who are interested in success for all, we're, we're more interested in, but how can we make everyone successful, not just the children of the rich, right? Both of these models are testable, if you have the right data. They have power to explain things, and the linear path may not be enough to capture all of reality, but if it's enough to pay, say, government, spend your money here, that's powerful. Like, that's why, uh, what's its, uh, Project Head Start in the United States was started. 
because they found that, yes, this is true, but we can increase intelligence with rich stimulation in early childhood. So Sesame Street was created on television in the 1960s from American money because they realized that if you could stimulate children's minds, exposure to literacy, exposure to the ideas, they'll do better at school. And the research actually supports that. And if you do better at school, you stay at school longer. If you stay at school longer, you do better in life. You get better jobs. And uh, what's his name? Uh, James Flynn in, the United, in New Zealand. Actually, it's called the Flynn Effect. And what he finds is that people who do better at school get better jobs. They have better success in life. And they find partners who are like themselves, being at university, didn't do better jobs. And so they pass that wealth to the next generation, not just economic wealth, but cultural wealth. The ability to do well at school, the expectation that you do well at school, and we can help you do better at school if you're struggling. We can pay for resources. We can stimulate you. We take you on travels, all those things. So you get the high socioeconomic, and it's, just, it's like a circular thing. So the answer, the, an the World Bank believes that the problem of society around the world can be solved if you can get girls educated. And if you can figure out how to get girls educated in any country in the world, the World Bank will give you a truckload of money to make it happen. Because girls who get educated raise fewer children who are better educated, who do better in society. It's almost that simple. Right. Not all linear relationships are straight lines. Sometimes there are fancy equations. But I like to start with the simple ones. Is it a straight line? Is it going backwards? Is it going up? Or is it constant? That's what I want to know. If, if I increase this, will this other thing go up? Or does it just stay the same? The curved ones, they're linear. But they are really much more difficult to explain to people in government. <laughs> so this is the exponential curve, the quadratic curve, the cubic curve, and the fancier the curve, the harder it is to understand and explain. The straight line is probably wrong, but it's much easier to understand, right? <laughs> so let's accept that we could be limiting reality simply because we want to be able to persuade voters, politicians, government officials to do certain things. Right. Oh, sorry, these diagrams have covered the words. This is a formative model. These items create the sin index. This is the sociologist socioeconomic status index. Years of education, income, where you live, things like that. The psychologist uses a reflective model that says this latent trait is reflected in the answers to the observed behaviors. And this is much more the world that we're in. We're going to say, this latent thing exists. And it is manifested by these behaviors. And we want to know how true is that. And what the circles are. Sorry? Circles. These ones? Yep. That's the everything I didn't explain ah. that influenced how you answered this question. Everything that's not in my model, the, the error, the residual, the universe. Oh, good. Nearly yeah, done. Education has very complicated data, let alone psychology or medicine. Everything is complicated. So we want to see, does our theory of how this is working, does it fit the data? We have to assume that the data is correct. If you have a thousand people who answered questions, it's hard to believe that those thousand people were wrong. If you ask three people, they might lie to you and you know you might get a very false understanding. But when you're big numbers, it's harder to believe that they're wrong. Your model might be right, but if it doesn't fit the data, it's wrong, right? Even though good Marxist would say that, um, does it work in theory? We were interested in, does it work in practice? 
Does our theory explain the data? And that means there are multiple data, multiple models that will fit the data. And we'll look at, in this course, on how to identify different kinds of models and how to evaluate which model fits the data best. And can I still explain it? Right? That's the tension. Does, my, does the model reflect the theory and is it close to the data? Will it be perfectly a match to the data? No, because there's error. And the question is, can you persuade two or three readers, reviewers, examiners, that your answer is the correct one? Or at least believable, trustworthy. Yeah, I might not do it that way, but okay, it makes sense. So we have to have theory. The model has to fit the theory. We have to have a logic that explains how this model works. And the statistics have to support our preferred answer. So, the world of what we're going to do this week has all of this stuff in it. Theories that explain how I think this data works. And those theories were present when you designed the study. When you chose the items, when you chose the scales, when you chose the people you were going to administer them to. Nobody approaches the data that they have without a theoretical or conceptual understanding of what they were trying to do. So, instead of just throwing things in the air and see where they land, we actually test our models, our mental model. This is what I think is supposed to happen. Was I right? One of the things that goes wrong is usually that experts, and if you're a PhD student, you're already on your way to becoming an expert compared to people in education, um, you're, you can see distinctions that other people don't make. You say, well, this is not quite the same as that. But out there in the real world, teachers or students, parents might go, well, no, those, those are the same thing. What are you talking about? And so your lovely, elegant factor structure breaks down because people don't make the distinctions you do. And that's what your job is. So confirmatory factor analysis and structural equation modeling create these linear regressions to identify how things are connected. The latent things that we can't measure, but we believe are there, that influence things. The manifest and the unexplained, the residuals, the, the universe. Confirmatory factor analysis helps us prove that these items belong together and I can use them as a scale. <coughs> and they allow us to look at multiple things simultaneously. So this is the advantage of the world that we're going to go into, is multiple parameters estimated simultaneously with measures of, does it fit? Is it, but that's not a measure of, is it right? Is it right does not come from the data. It comes from the theory. Okay, so does it fit is very important. It must work and it must fit. But if you can't explain it, then it's just luck, right? By luck, you will get a correct, statistically significant answer, usually one time out of every 20. And if you run 20 factor models, one of them will probably be correct, will fit by chance, right? So you don't want to go around and sell that one as the answer when it wasn't true. So theory and data, and our modeling is where we try to bring those two together. I've said what I wanted to say for this intro.